When the Führer says, Wie ist der Master Race? Wie heil, heil. Right in the Führer space, not to love the Führer. is a great disgrace, so be heil, heil. Right in the Führer space. Gilroy was here. This simple phrase, with a funny little guy poking his nose over a wall, foxhole, or hedgerow, then and now is the G.I.'s best friend. He was and is always there for a little rebellion, fun, and comfort. Hi, my name is Pat Tillery. I am the founder and editor of KilroyWasHere.org, a site dedicated to keeping the memory of Kilroy Was Here and with the world gone mad around them, the combat GI's undominable spirit that Kilroy embodies. What you're about to see is a historic interview with James J. Kilroy's family. But first I want to thank the host of the story behind the story, Jack Peterson, the producer, Roger Hardy, Medfield TV, and members of the Kilroy family who graciously agreed to this interview. One more thing. As MacArthur said, I shall return. So please stay for an important message at the end of this interview. Truly, Kilroy was here. The story came from Halifax. He lived in Halifax when it took place. He was born in Boston. And then he died 60 years later in November of 1962. He uh, had three brothers and three sisters and the Massachusetts legislature, the Boston City Council, and he wound up marrying the prettiest girl in Roxbury, so they said at the time. Her name was Margaret Erna, and she grew up in Roxbury also. He uh, finally uh, went to work at Four River during 1941, and uh, we lived there. Uh, we moved down there in June of 1942. It was after the school year was up. 1946, a radio program had a contest about who was the real Kilroy? And he entered, he, and there were des dozens of letters, but uh, they read it and read it, they read all the letters, and they finally decided this was the most logical. This is the person who just had to be the real Kilroy. So they decided that he was the winner of the contest and would um, get the streetcar. And I do remember that just about a day before, one of my brothers, probably Bob, kind of whispered to us that there was something big going to happen. Because my father had won a contest, and we were going to the common, and we were going to see the prize, which was a trolley car. So what I do remember is being on the trolley car, and that uh, because it was just such a, a new experience. And I remember the conductor showing you and Jimmy how it ran and letting them you know, We drive actually it drove it. It was a viable streetcar. Yeah, I, yeah. I do remember you driving yeah. it, you know, yeah. stopping and, uh, and I, from my point of view, the niftiest thing was you could drive it from the front and the back. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I believe you have a picture of uh, I do. everybody <laughs> sitting on, you know, on that. If you want to hold that up. This is a picture of all of us when we went up to see the streetcar. And my father, of course, has the conductor's hat on. It came to the house, and um, it was really a production. It was delivered in November, I think, uh, shortly after yeah. that, because it was delivered before Christmas. And they promised to come down and turn it into bedrooms, turn it into a big playroom, and it came down. And of course, back then, it was before the um, expressway was built. So you have all these little country roads. that This huge car is up on uh, railroad ties on a big truck. They had to cut the wires going across streets. They had to cut trees. Then they had to swing it into place on this little dirt road and put it in beside a house. It was really a production. It was 42 feet long and it weighed 22 tons. Yeah. It was big. Everybody in the neighborhood was standing in the street. They couldn't believe what they were seeing. One full large streetcar in Halifax. Uh, you know, with the viewing audience, tell them, now wait a minute, now you were saying, Margaret, and Ann, as you showed a picture of that streetcar, this was placed beside your house. Right beside the house. As a matter of fact, it, it was up on a stack of railroad ties, mm -hmm. so it dwarfed the house. It was higher than the mm -hmm. house. The house was a one-story, very small, it was a uh, <laughs> summer cottage mm -hmm. that we had all gone down every summer from the time I was born. 
And then when we moved down in uh, June of 1942, we stayed there. And it was just a four-room cottage with a screened-in porch and no <coughs> indoor plumbing, no central heat, and there we were. Remember the trolley car, as I got older, is one of the best toys anybody could ever have. <laughs> I mean, it had, you, the bell rang, the doors opened, the seats went forward when you were going forward and backwards when you were going in the other direction. Now in our yard, forward was into the chicken pen, <laughs> and backwards was into 13th Avenue, which was a little dirt street. <laughs> in our right imaginations. <laughs> in our imagination. All of the posters were up there, so we could flip those over and write our own advertisements up there. But all the kids in the neighborhood would come, and we had a good time playing on it. There were seven of us. There were seven of no, our parents. Seven, seven of us, meaning, meaning seven kids. Seven children. With two adults. Yes. Right. I'm quite sure people will wonder, well, how did it all get started? Okay, well, uh, his being a rate setter, his job was to uh, set a price on rivets. It was much more difficult to uh, drive rivets underneath something or behind something than it was up on deck. You know, there were different uh, difficulty levels, and he would set the price per rivet because back then the men got paid on piecework. And after the job was done, after the riveting crew finished, he would count the rivets and write down exactly how many rivets were um, driven, I guess, and what their value was. And a lot of the men complained that he really wasn't going down to see where they were driving rivets, that it was a lot more difficult than he said it was, and that there were a lot more rivets than he said there were. And they got to actually sometimes erasing his check mark, and it would get counted twice. Well, finally he got so he was criticized for it, and then he was so angry, he just started to write not only a check mark, but Kilroy was here. And he wrote it in um, a yellow wax crayon that you use for carpentry. And he did that. And then these ships um, left Four River, they were called Liberty ships, and they were built in like two to three weeks at a time. And they left Four River with um, soldiers and sailors who were going all over the world uh, to fight these various battles and they'd see this slogan in the strangest places and they got to talking to each other and everything and uh, when they landed they said you know something let's write that on this you know let's write that on this and it just spread so that's how it started it really was a legend my father did not put that logo on it and he was never really sure where that occurred um, there were different you know, different scenarios about how it came about, but um, he didn't do it, but it got attached to Kilroy was here and was part of the legend. When they build a ship, they start out with something that looks like an egg crate yes, right. in the bottom of a pit, and they keep stacking on top of it. Well, when it's in an egg crate form, everybody's standing up doing their thing, and my father signed it. Those became watertight compartments on the ships. Yeah. They sealed them. They had watertight doors. But once a year, the sailors would have to inspect all of the watertight compartments along what they called the shaft alley in the base of the ship. The yeah, sailors would come back right. out of the shaft alleys right. and start writing it everywhere. Yeah. <clears throat> August crawling in there, a filthy, rusty place with a flashlight, and the only thing he sees is Kilroy was here. Now he's, he's 80 feet down. How in hell did that get there? So that, that was part of the yeah. mystery of it, but it was put there when it was sitting out in daylight. First time that you realized that the little caricature was going along with Kilroy was here, signature. Well, I think it did occur early on in the war, but you know, I think, um, I think this was more a military um, slogan. The, the soldiers and sailors had it all over the world. But it hadn't really spilled into the civilian population. When we were growing up, we didn't hear that much about it until the um, <coughs> uh, contest took place. And the contest, of course, was on a national broadcast. And then everybody heard about it, and people started to share stories with each other. Whenever we saw Kilroy was here, the logo was with it. But my father said that he never put it there. But you're right. Whenever. For some reason or other, whenever the uh, servicemen wrote it, they often would put that logo on top. So you'd think that he was a famous world traveler, he was very sophisticated. 
He didn't leave Halifax. He <laughs> stayed in Halifax and uh, went to work every day at Four River. During the war, you didn't have enough gas to do anything except go to work and go shopping once a week. And that was it. My father had uh, nine children, all of whom were married. And he wound up with 30 grandchildren, many of whom were married. And he now has 35 great-grandchildren so far. I was in Paris. I was at the <coughs> embassy in Paris for two and a half years. And I put her on the Eiffel Tower and I put her on the uh, Arc de Triomphe. I'm sure they've cleaned it since. That was 51 years ago. <laughs> My father would actually get mail that said Kilroy and had the logo. It wouldn't say Halifax, wouldn't say Massachusetts, wouldn't say anything. This was before zip codes. It would just say Kilroy and have the logo and it would be delivered to our house. And today, if somebody addresses Kilroy was here, Halifax, Massachusetts, it goes to the town hall and they send it down to me. And we were expecting a call, of course. And um, all of a sudden the news, was, the radio just got broken in with a bulletin that James J. Kelly had passed away. And it was also on the Huntley Brinkley Report. It was in Time Magazine under, under the milestone section. This is where my parents are both buried, James J. Kilroy and my mother, Margaret. Uh, they're buried here among their friends and contemporaries in Halifax, many of whom served in the various wars. You can see the flags that indicate their graves. I just wanted to say thank you for each and every one of you, merchant marine, servicemen, and all of the servicemen. But you opened the door of opportunity for, for every one of my generation, and I want to say thank you for your service. Production support provided by Medfield.tv. Access to our community. Kilroy was here, was with every GI on every combat mission or other assignment during World War II in Korea. He continues in the Gulf War, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He has been and is the GI's best friend. No matter how bad it got, how dirty, how exhausted, wounded, or scared a GI was, he found that Kilroy had already been there and survived. Ask any vet and he will tell you just how much fun and comfort Kilroy is. As we lose the greatest generation, estimates range from 1,000 to 1,500 a day, we at KilroyWasHere.org have been trying for a decade to get the U.S. Postal Service to issue a Kilroy Was Here commemorative stamp. This postage stamp, if approved, would be the one last and lasting thank you to the World War II and Korean War vets before they go. But Kilroy Was Here is not limited to World War II and Korea. Sightings continue in Iraq, Afghanistan, and throughout the world. Please help us get that stamp. To help us with this effort, write to the address on the screen. Press the pause button if necessary. Or go to KilroyWasHere.org. About three sections down, on page one is a section with a black background and three proposed stamps. There it says, quote, to keep trying for a Kilroy Was Here stamp, click the star, unquote. A window will open offering three choices. One, print a preformatted letter that you can mail to the committee. Two, print a preformatted petition that you can get signed and mail to the committee. Or three, with one click, send a preformatted email to me. I print and mail them every Monday. Help us get that stamp. Not to love the Fuhrer is a great disgrace, so be high, high, right in the Fuhrer's face.